I never, uh, I, I can't swear that there were none, but I never saw a brothel, which I have seen since. In fact, a f uh, one block away from me, there was a wonderful children's library, a very big children's library, which was closed down after unification, like everything else, by the way. Industry, everything was closed down and taken over by the West. The children's library was closed down, and across the street from it, a brothel was opened up, in a way that was symbolic. Um, however, and not only that, there were almost no nude pictures except one monthly magazine had an art, nude art photo, which is always in great demand and hard to get. On the other hand, the big fad in East Germany was nude bathing, which meant about a third of the beaches in, on the Baltic and big sections of all the lakes were nude bathing. Not separate from the other, there was usually a sign up saying FKK, that means free body culture was the name for free nude bathing. And it was taking over more and more. In fact, it often mixed with the so-called textile speech where people wore bathing suits. Uh, they almost, sometimes the people with textile didn't like it, but, but they got used to it. Nude bathing was the big fad, except that there was uh, uh, by the way, my wife insisted on it. She just said, I don't want to wear any wet, wet old bathing suit. And, uh, and she, uh, uh, she uh, it was on, mostly on a family basis. You didn't see stalkers or any, it was, a, you went there, you, 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 you took your clothes off, you went bathing, you went back to usually a mound in the sand. It was the basic, uh, one of the main basic things. And this meant, yes, this book is evidently very interesting because women getting equal wages and over 90% working, unlike in the West, meant that women were much more independent and could be, which meant that if they had husbands who, who they couldn't get along with, who they couldn't get along with and who were um, either brutal or, or too lazy, or maybe an alcoholic, they could say go to hell, because they were independent. I mean, it wasn't an easy decision, but that's what it was. In any case, it was a very different scene, and in the, as this woman found, women in the East, according to the polls, had more orgasms than women in the West. <laughs> and, uh, and in general, uh, more often, and better with more mutual agreement than in the West. Right. So there were differences. Right. Not only that, but in the general way of getting along with people. People's minds weren't completely changed in one or two generations, and there was plenty of greed and envy and so forth, also in East Germany. But by and large, there wasn't this rivalry between colleagues and between people, and they found that the general atmosphere was much more family conscious and friendly and un and relaxed. Mm. Good. That was your question. Yeah, well, okay. go ahead. No, okay, the next question. He said, I, I lived in China for 10 years. Somehow the PRC manages to raise the mass standard of living, allow travel all over the world. What was the failure of Soviet zone, uh, in, so in Soviet zone? Um, that's well, first of all, I'll say Soviet zone was correct until 1949, <clears throat> when the GD the term was correct was until 1949. But then, when the GDR was founded, it was used in the West as depreciate so as, as bad. They used it. They always called it the Soviet zone. Um, we didn't use that term after 1949. Uh, the reason that travel was restricted, and it was restricted, it meant, uh, first of all, I should say, you, you could hardly travel to the West for many, many years until you reach pension age. Pensioners, that meant 60 for women, 65 for men, they could travel westward, uh, basically to visit relatives in West Germany, but also they could travel further um, for one month a year or up to one month a year. Uh, otherwise, the only people who traveled west were people who for some professional, either sports or conferences or such. This was a very bitter point, especially with young people. The reasons were, I would say, double. First of all, 
they were basically afraid that people would go over there and not come back. Because once they got over there, they were lured. I know one case, two bassoonists, an orchestra had guest tourney through West Germany. At every stop, bassoonists were rare in orchestras in those days. They were approached and everyone and said, wouldn't you like to stay here? You'll earn much more, offering everything. I had a friend who was a journalist. He traveled to this, uh, here to, to Los Angeles in advance of the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Uh, they, it wasn't yet clear that the GDR would not take part. It was still planned, and he was part of a journalist group. When he was here, he was approached by two gentlemen, I, I need not name where they came from, who said, wouldn't you like to stay here? And he said, well, I think about it. Uh, what are the advantages? Well, we pay you as much as you want, basically. He said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, what about a home? Yeah, you'll have a wonderful home. And then he said, what about friends? Could I bring any friends? <laughs> they said, well, you might. You also, how, how many were you thinking of? He said, well, about 16 or 17 million. <laughs> and, and that's when they, it ended <laughs> with that. For that, they didn't give him his flight tickets back wow. till the very last moment, kept him. And when he got back to Berlin, he found that his, his luggage had been cut through by a knife all the time. There was a constant attempt to win people away from the GDR. That was one reason. The other reason was that you couldn't send people to the West Germany with no money. But Western money was always in short supply. They had to give them 15 marks, which is very little when they went over, and pay for their tickets in East money. And yet the fare was mostly in West money. The GDR finances had to make up for that. And they just couldn't afford it. In the last two years, of the GDR, one or two million people were able to visit the West. Amazing. It was not that nobody could go. More and more people could go to visit for, for weddings, funerals, birthdays. There was a joke if your aunt, they said there's a shortage of spades. People are digging, trying to find a relationship with somebody in the West as an excuse for getting going over there to visit Aunt Minna's 68th birthday. Uh, and yet, this problem, especially for young, young people, was a terrible, terrible problem. The GDR just couldn't finance it and was afraid of losing people. Okay, next question. What was the state of civil, liber civil liberties in the GDR and how did people feel about it? They already answered that. <laughs> it's complicated. It's complicated because it was not as some people imagine, especially if you've seen that film, The Life of Others, where you imagine everybody fearfully. No, this is not true. People talked quite freely in private, but at meetings, people did not, were not openly critical. They were, not that they were afraid of going to prison. Maybe in the first three years, this could happen with a, 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 an anti-joke or something. After the first few years, I would say after Stalin's death, basically, this was no longer true. People talked quite freely, but not publicly. At a meeting, whether in school or in the union or other places, people held back with their criticism because they didn't want to get into a, 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 an unpleasant argument to defend themselves. And there's also a question of perks. If you were known as, a, as one who's always critical, this often seemed to mean you're pro-Western. And therefore, it could mean that you wouldn't get a, a promotion so easily, or you, it might be tougher to get this permission to visit the West, or it might uh, in some other way hurt your chances of getting your kids into college even, if you're considered a pro-Westerner. And this meant that the media were on one line, and in public, there was really only this one line. In private, people talked very, very freely, even with strangers, and they joked about the Staatssicherheit. The Staatssicherheit was tough for people who were in some kind of organizational op uh, uh, op opposition. Otherwise, people knew about it and didn't like the Staatssicherheit to answer that, but didn't worry so much about it. And I'll give you one little example. 
there was a, a, a building near ours where one section was reserved. We, we heard there was a rumor, but it was true, that it was reserved for families of Shatzishai people. My son was curious about it, was walking by one day, and he saw a little boy on a tricycle. He said, tell me, little boy, what does your daddy do? <clears throat> and the boy said, I'm not allowed to say, <laughs> which made it pretty clear where he worked. And I knew, in fact, my roommate at college, before I got married for a semester, turned out later, I found out only after le leaving college, and ran into it several times, that he was working for Staatssicherheit. I met him also afterwards when he, had, he told me he had been working for them. Why? Because he believed in fighting fascism. That was his motivation. Uh, and, and fighting to save the GDR, which was un constantly under threat until it went under. Uh, at the same time, an organization like Staatssicherheit or the police in any country tends to attract people who like to show their muscles and who can be, and of course, therefore, there were not good feelings, but it was not the situation as in this film, which was very well made and very well written and acted, but a, a, a very distorted film. I think that answers it, I think. Okay. So next Although it's question. A compli oh, no. I'll give you one example. Among working people, in the f years after unification, which we call the Vendor, the U-turn, uh, uh, in, in factories there was, a, there was a, a bon mot which made the rounds. It said, bef under the, in GDR days, if you were smart, you didn't criticize Eric Honecker or the other uh, party leaders you kept your criticism to yourself on that. But your foreman or your manager, you could criticize all you wanted because you couldn't get fired. Today, they said, it's the other, and now after, it's the other way around. You can call the, the politicians whatever you want to, but you better not cross you with your foreman because you can lose your job. And in this way, to me, there's a lot of symbolism in that. What is democracy? Where is democracy? And some levels they had more, some less. Uh, there were many ways there was much too little freedom and democracy, but they were under siege. This country was under constant siege. Just I came from McCarthy, America, with Mexico, Canada, Atlantic, and Pacific no, under no real threat. The GDR was threatened all the time from day one. And this led to a, a you would say, almost paranoia, except that it was based on realism. Okay, the next question is, what solution do you support to address unemployment? I'm, I suppose unemployment both here and in, in Germany? We, uh, uh, it must be. Uh, we didn't have it. <laughs> in fact, I could mention in one case, this, uh, there was a coal mine that was open pit coal mine, and it ran out of coal, so they had to close it down in, 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 in the GDR. For a year in advance, they checked with every employee there, and either if he was close to retirement age, he got a little earlier retirement. If he, he was in a trade which could be used elsewhere, like a carpenter, etc., etc., or a mason, they found another job for him. If he was in a trade simply mining, uh, which couldn't be found elsewhere, he got retraining but paid his wages, so that nobody had the fear of unemployment. Uh, today, it's very different, though Germany, like the United States, has a very low unemployment rate. At the same time, a large number of people who are in these precarious jobs, short-time jobs, half-paid jobs, uncertain jobs, and this is what has people very, very much worried, and sometimes turning to the right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, uh, since the ecological crisis is so severe, so serious, isn't it a good thing that the Green Party, uh, eco-socialism, is rising? And if not, why not? Yes. The Green Party is a strange party. It started <laughs> yeah. wh while the GDR was still alive in the West, and since the Communist Party was very, very small, it was the militant left-wing party. But <clears throat> gradually, it became tamer and tamer. It began to get positions in political scene. And when it did, including the foreign minister, together with this, they, they had a coalition with the Social Democrats. The foreign minister, Sepp Fischer, 
supported the bombing of Yugoslavia, of Serbia. In other words, took a position completely imperialist. And to this day, on foreign policy, they've supported, with a few exceptions, uh, there are some Greens who refuse to go along, but most of the Green Party have gone along with sending troops to Afghanistan, to Mali, and all these things. They've become inf and very anti-Russian, aggressively anti-Russian. In many ways, they're further in that direction than almost any other party. Also, they have never had close ties with working class. They are middle class, up to recently at least, they were middle class professional. And as these young militants tended to get jobs as a doctor or a dentist or in the government, they got tamer and tamer and were willing to join even Christian right-wingers in governments. And in, for, in one state in southwest Germany, f they have one state where the Green is the minister president, the only one. By the way, there's one with a left minister president in the East, but in the West, and he has become close friends with the two big companies in his area. That's da Daimler and Porsche, or Porsche as you call it. Uh, in other words, they've moved. At the same time, they're good on some issues. Uh, they're good on immigrants. They're not racist. They're good on women's rights. They're good on uh, gay rights. They're good on such things. But as soon as you get to working class, they say to fight for green rights together with the big companies, which is already a contradiction. <laughs> and in foreign policy, they're the nastiest, most vicious of all. And therefore, the fact that they now become the strongest party, we will raise lots of questions. Also, to what degree does one work with them in coalitions on the state level or other levels? It's a complicated business which is not yet completely clear how, how, what directions they'll take now with their new ama uh, amazing upward swing. Okay, the next question. There are two questions from this person. Were all the good things you described uh, decided in committees or worker councils or by the government? So that's the first question. The second Hold question. Hold second. Okay, yeah. you answer that. It's a mix. Basically, they were decided on the highest level, frankly. Uh, this meant the polit Politburo of the, uh, of the party, and especially even there, it was centralized to Walter Oberst and then Eric Honecker. Uh, at the same time, uh, and they made the basic lines, but there were pressures from below constantly, which were reflected in two ways. Partly in the factories, where the workers were not afraid of losing their jobs, and in some factories more and some factories less, they, they presented their demands on their factory level, not on a higher level because the productivity of the factory, its product, had to be decided centrally, more or less. A constant problem, how much more and how much less, so that they had an influence in the factory level. But the basic decisions had to be made centrally and they were made centrally. At the same time, uh, at the same time, this pressure was not only in the factories, and I'll give you an example, a funny one. Uh, one party congress, which usually announced its plans for big changes and improvements, and they, one party congress uh, made plans for a, a big improvement for young people. Credits, uh, young people who got married got a $7,000 credit, no interest to be paid back over years with no interest, and reduced if they had children. <laughs> it was sharply reduced. Uh, but uh, older people complained. They said that, uh, they said, we did all the hard work after the war, trying to reconstruct and get the ruins away. We did the, we did the backbreaking work. And now the young people are getting all the advantages. So there was grumbling, which resulted in a joke among old people. The joke was, have you heard the news? The party Congress has made is thinking now thinking of us too. They're, they're going to pass a new law which says everybody over in pension age can cross the street without regard to w whether it's red or green light. <laughs> <laughs> and then they added, you can after 65 you can cross without red or green light. After 75 you have to cross with red light, <laughs> which was a nasty, a nasty push. 
But this kind of pressure, partly reflected through the party groups, which were all over the place in every factory and neighborhood, was reflected up above. For example, this one resulted in changes the only one I can remember personally, but there were more, but the one I remembered is a new law which said that working people in the last five years, especially manual jobs, the last five years would get easier jobs but at the same pay. So that this was reflected. Uh, uh, I think that's, an, in other words, I don't want to prettify it. It was centrally run, but the pressures from below were there on, the, and on every level too. Okay, the second question from the same person is, today, uh, in Russia, is it the same as you described in GDR, to your knowledge? And what will the bubble, I suppose, economic bubble pop, will what do? What will the one? What will the economic bubble popping globally will do to Russia? I can't really answer for Russia. I mean, I naturally, I observe it very, as closely as I can. But I, my particular feelings, but I'm not an, a, any more expert than any of you, is I don't love Putin. Uh, he's not my man. And every time I see him going like this, I sort of jump yeah, really. <laughs> when he does this. Whether he believes it or not is another question. At the same time, first of all, I believe that Putin, following Yeltsin, saved Russia basically from total collapse, economic collapse. And, and preserved it and raised the economy as much as he could. And not only that, but I think that Putin's main object in terms of the world is basically to defend Russia, which is under attack, under constant attack from a, a force which I need not name, which has managed to surround it almost totally, not only with bases, but with troops. Estonia, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, Ukraine, and so forth. And he has to fight back on that. And in this, he has my total support. Uh, uh, and, and what happens within Russia, between, there's, there are communists, there's several communist groups opposing him. I can't take sides on these because I don't live there. But I support completely his determination to save Russia. As, as I see it, Russia and China being the two main forces in the world opposing this attempt to rule the whole world completely. And of course, I shouldn't forget Cuba, Venezuela, to an extent Nicaragua, but, but, uh, but which are so much smaller and weaker. But Russia has to defend itself, and therefore this Russiagate business, which has been going on not only here but in Germany, um, in Germany with less success than here, but also the media push it, push it, push it, hate Putin, hate Russia. Uh, has not caught on so much with a large part of the population, at least a, 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 at least a, a majority, maybe not a big majority. But this, it seems to me, is extremely dangerous. No matter whether the Russians took part in 2016 uh, election or not, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, but whether they did or not, we know how much the United States mixed in every election in the world, but especially the Russian ones. So that I... Uh, that's my position. And what, the second part of it was the, the problems of the future. Well, yeah. we'll have to see. <laughs> okay. How is Trump received uh, now in eastern part of Germany? How, how what? How is Trump. Trump received? Trump. Trump. Oh, uh, nobody likes him. I would say. I've, I have, no, I'll amend that. Among left-wing people, including many of my friends there, there have been quarrels about it. Why? Because, uh, going back to 2016, we knew that Hillary Clinton was a war hawk and a, and a, and a, a dangerous war hawk. She was for every war. Libya, Syria played a, a nasty part Honduras. in all of these war things. It, it seemed impossible to support Hillary Clinton. Trump, crazy as he was, and probably without a clue on foreign policy, and uh, unpredictable as he was, in the early times it seemed that he wanted, first of all, to get out of Syria, to get out of Afghanistan, and to, to talk with Putin. And this seemed to many people, and to me too, as one constructive side of Trump. And yet his domestic policy here 
verges really cl closer and closer to fascism. You couldn't support him here either. What the hell to do? I vote, since I was able to return to the United States, by the way, in 1994, the army discharged me after 42 years. And that means that I vote in elections. Luckily, I vote in New York, so I didn't have to choose what to do. I voted for, I, I voted for Jill Steele. Um, but it made this, uh, among left wings, in fact, even today, Trump seemed willing to talk with North Korea. Whether Clinton would have, I doubt it. And the, the Democratic Party leadership, to me, does not seem inclined. In fact, that's our problem. The, the, many of the attacks against Trump, are, it seems to me, are for the wrong reason. Not because it's his fascist tendencies, especially in domestic, and his racism and, and, and pressure, but because he seems to want to pull back militarily in some ways, not in Venezuela, mm -hmm. and not in, uh, in, but in some ways, what, but of course he's under the influence of Pompeo and Bolton, who, uh, who, who obviously are dictating. So it makes it a complicated situation among leftists. In general, however, the population, they either laugh at Trump or hate him uh, almost generally. This dispute was among some leftists where, where we argue about these questions. Okay, the next question is about the 75th anniversary of the U.S.-British troops landing in Normandy, yes. which was just celebrated. Yes. And, uh, uh, and was presented here as the turning point of the war. In truth, it was the Battle of Stalingrad yes. where the courageous, courageous Soviet troops uh, def uh, defended yeah. and defeated the Germans. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, the question, I, that's not the question. The question is, do you think Stalin jeopardized defense of the USSR by executing the Red Army general staff before the war uh -huh. uh, and the Stalin-Hitler pact yes. uh, discouraging people ideologically in the fight? Uh, a complicated question, which of course I... Uh, dealt with constantly in my thoughts and discussions, uh, especially because I've come to meet one fellow, some of you may have heard him, Grover Fur, who, who says Stalin was, was the greatest and Khrushchev was the one who, who, who screwed things up. I would say, first of all, about the Hitler-Stalin pact, it was a, I was old enough to have to defend Russia at that time, although I was in, in junior high, but still I was the one person defending the Soviets. I think it's, I still believe, it was a, a nasty as it was in so many ways. It was forced upon the Soviet Union yeah. because there was obviously a conspiracy of the West to let Hitler take care of Stalin, uh, of the Soviet Union, and then move in and, and, and profit from the defeat of both of them, but against the Soviet. They proved it in Spain, where they supported Hitler and Mussolini. They proved it in every way. And therefore, I think that this Hitler-Stalin pact was absolute necessity, but unfortunate that it was also done in some bad ways. The question of anti-fascism was played down within the Soviet Union, and some German communists were victimized by this. Some were forced to return back to Germany, although they were communists. Uh, so that there were many sides to this, but the basic thing was they had to do it. Second of all, Stalingrad, and of, of course, in the entire West, but especially the United States, Normandy is the, the turning point. And in Germany, they, they, they're against the Nazis, so they, they also, in the official propaganda, supports the Normandy as the turning point. It's obviously nonsense. It was, of course, it was a terrible battle and, and, and a bloody battle and an awful lot of people lost their lives, uh, also in Italy. But at the same time, it's obvious who carried the main burger burden by far was the so was Soviet Union, which people tend to forget lost 27 or 25, 27 million people. That's, that's much more than even in the Holocaust were lost, six million. People forget that. And, dis and in Germany, they do everything. To, to, of course, the left doesn't. And I'll tell you one incident. I had been in the GDR only a few months, actually about three months. In February 1953, I was, I wouldn't say surprised, well, but o overjoyed. The, victim, the, the victory in Stalingrad 
was officially celebrated as a victory of anti-fascism in the GDR. We had a big parade to the center of our town. I, I think a lot of the working, w workers there saw it rather as a chance to get home a little early. <laughs> but it, I can't say that everyone was convinced. But it was an official uh, marked uh, in the GDR, which shows the, uh, the difference. What about the exec it, execution of the generals? Uh, uh, yes, about the executions. This, this Professor Grover Fur uh, implies that if all those people who were executed, the generals and others, well, may not have been guilty, but they may have been guilty, and he takes a sort of a mixed stand. I would say many of them may have been uh, 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 disagreeing with Stalin's uh, strategy or tactics, but traitors, I sort of doubt, there were pro undoubtedly some, but I tend not to think, and since I'm very close to the question of Spain all my life, as I indicated, I know that some of the most heroic people from Spain, including the general, who was of Austrian background, but used a Spanish name, Gomez, who was one of the main officers to save Madrid in its worst times, and another aviator and aviation general paved the way for the, the one victory the Spanish Republic had at Guadalajara. He paved the way as an aviator and one of the best journalists in Spain about the Civil War was a, a, a Russian journalist called Koltsov. These went, when they went back to the Soviet Union, they were all killed. And this to me, this fellow Grover, who I've met now for the first time a, a few weeks ago, has not been able to answer my questions on this. I refuse to believe that these people were traitors. They were the greatest heroes of Spain. And, uh, and you know about it. Huh? Uh, at the same time, I'll add one final point, however. Uh, also, this Professor Grover is correct in opposing all the constant propaganda whenever this question of Spanish war comes up, of saying the Soviets were to blame for that the Republic went uh, died. This is all bullshit. If the Soviets hadn't helped in Spain, Madrid would have fallen within a short time. And they would never have held out two and a half years without the support from the Soviet Union. Despite all the difficult times that was in the middle of this purge area, there were lots of mistakes and blunders and some of them tragic which were made. But without the Soviet Union, only the Soviet Union and Mexico were the only two countries which supported the Spanish Republic. All the others boy, helped fascists, helped Muslim, Mussolini and Hitler. And in this, this fellow Grover Fur is correct. And in today, a lot of the propaganda, Stalin, Stalinism, etc., comparing it to the Nazis, this, as it seems to me, is a method not only against Stalin and the, the terrible things he did, and oversimplifying because some of the things he did were very necessary, but is used to discredit the whole Soviet Union. And in discrediting the whole Soviet Union and all that they accomplished in those few years they had before Hitler came and so forth, to discredit the idea of socialism. And this I reject completely. Did Stalin order oh, those me. executions? What, what? Did Stalin order those executions? Did Stalin order? I wasn't there. Okay, uh, I, I, I believe if he didn't, he must have, he must have approved them. Uh, but uh, Grover first says it was one of Stalin's assistants who was responsible. I cannot judge on that, and I won't judge on that, but I say he, he couldn't have disproved it over a long period of time, and therefore I can't say it, he was, had nothing to do with it. But this is a problem which I'm not a historian. Okay, next question. Beyond the protests, how did people in GDR identify with the mass movements in the West when you were there, and these were happening here, and the civil rights struggle that was going on? How did they identify with that? Very much. I won't say everybody, but there was a very, very big movement, which I can illustrate here. For example, for Angela Davis. For Angela Davis, I have a photograph here of myself telephoning with, either with Angela or with one of her lawyers uh, 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 and translating at the, newspaper, the youth newspaper, which had a giant campaign which resulted in all the schools in the GDR, thou hundreds of thousands of children and youngsters 
wrote cards and letters to Angela Davis, the younger ones with a rose, either they painted or they printed a rose on it, and it came by the in huge sacks by the truckload to Marin County, or how's it pronounced? Marin, yeah. Marin, Marin, Marin County. Yeah. It, truckloads all from the GDR, not from any of the other countries even, but from the GDR, so much so that the judge was just absolutely amazed by well, what's up here. And a, a, a terrific awareness. Again, in the GDR, you had some people who were not politically interested, you had some people who were right-wing,